Good afternoon. So we're gonna we're gonna continue uh, we're gonna continue our discussion on on vibrations, and we're gonna we're gonna stick with the easiest one for now, which is the undamped free vibrations case. We just touched on it last class. We did the horizontal mass and spring. You're gonna see a lot of these mass and spring systems. We're gonna do the next one. So the next one is to consider what happens when we do a vertical version of a mass spring system. Right? So all I'm going to do is the same thing that I showed you last class, but now I'm going to be interested in looking at the following. So let's assume that that is my, my spring hanging down a, a, from a ceiling, and this is my known L0, my unstretched length. And what I do from there is I hang the mass from the spring. So my mass and spring system now looks like this. This is my equilibrium position. So this is at equilibrium, my neutral position. And the, the spring is already stretched. And so this is already stretched by, say, a certain distance, delta L. So this is an L now. It's equal to an L naught plus a delta L, right? And even on top of that, I'm going to do the exact same thing I did last class. I'm going to take this mass. If I draw it again. So from this equilibrium position, I'm going to now state that this is my y is equal to 0. This is my new datum line, y is equal to 0. Perhaps I do positive y downwards, just to switch it up a little bit. And then from this position, what I do is I disturb it a little. I pull it down and have it displace by a teeny amount in the y direction, which, which I call y as a function of time. So my displacements are in the y direction. They are a function of time. And they're small, right? small compared to, say, size of the spring, length of spring. OK? So let's do the analysis on that. The first thing that you'll note is that, obviously, we're going to do our typical sum of forces, in this case, in the y direction. Uh, and it should be an MAY. And maybe I'll just look at the first free body diagram. If I do a, a typical m, mg down, at equilibrium, what is the force that is just keeping the mass still? It is the mass from the spring that is being stretched by a little bit amount, that delta L. Right? So I'm going to call this my k delta L force. And so at equilibrium, what do you expect? You expect there to be no acceleration in the A. So all the forces are balanced. It's 0. And in the y direction that I've indicated, clearly it would be like an mg minus k delta L. And so I can even just calculate immediately what the size of this delta L would be. The size of this delta L is guaranteed to be a, uh, uh, a relationship that links together the mass of the, the, the particle hanging from the spring and the spring constant k. OK, so we know what delta L is immediately. Question is, how does the mass behave uh, in terms of y of t when you start to perturb it from its neutral position? So I redo the mass balance equation, MAY. And this time, You'll note that I like to call my ay my second derivative in space. So I can actually write this as my double dot, just like I did last class, right? I did mx double dot. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say this must be similar to this. It should be mg, but it's not just k delta l. Now it would be minus k, and it should be delta l and plus a little bit, plus the y. 
Okay? Does that make sense? Basically the same thing, but I, I moved it, right? I moved it by exactly that displacement y, the function of t that I'm talking about. So this is my y a function of t, how much I have pulled it downwards and then released it. Okay, so, so that's my new equation. And then I got to look at what I know and what I don't know. It looks to me like this delta L is now going to be the same delta L that I would expect from my calculation at the equilibrium position. So let me rewrite this as m y double dot is equal to m g minus k. And then I'm going to substitute in that m g over k bit plus my variable y. And what do you notice? What you should notice is that this is an m g minus these k's cancel for this m g. So this m g and this m g are gone. So what am I left with? I am left with m y double dot is equal to negative k y. In other words, m y double dot plus k y is equal to zero. And therefore, we happen to be dealing with exactly the same ordinary differential equation as we did in the x direction. The fact that the mass is hanging down and already pre-stretching that length of spring has nothing to do with predicting the sinusoidal displacement of the mass as it bobs up and down. OK? Is that, is that clear? So same as horizontal, which is very, very convenient. And just note that you, you better pick your datum line correctly and pick it to be y is equal to 0 where the spring is already pre-stretched. And then from there, all of your y displacements are measured from that y is equal to 0 point. OK? OK, so that was just a quick little um, extension of what we did last class. Free, undamped vibrations, now horizontal and vertical, the same thing. We did one example last class already, putting in some numbers. Let's do another example. And because we just got to keep practicing these things to gain more and more familiarity with it. So I'm going to do my typical single mass, single spring system. And I'm going to give you all the information that I started with last class. Right? So I did m, I give you the mass, I give you the k. Right? And then I always give you these initial conditions with displacement and velocity. So I'm going to tell you here that, uh, see, what did I say here? y of 0 negative 90 millimeters. Okay, so that's my initial displacement. I pulled it down. Actually, no, so the downward is positive in my diagram, so this is actually a uh, push up. I've compressed the spring upward by 90 millimeters, and then I'm also giving you an initial velocity, my y prime of 0, and I'm saying that it is 0.4 meters per second. Okay? And this minus sign means it is initially moving upwards. Initially upward motion. Okay? So last class we did one where the thing was at rest first, but now I'm going to I'm going to push it. Okay? So I've compressed it and I've even given it a, a little nudge upwards. And so it says, find y of t. Okay, so the equation of motion for this bobbing mass. Okay, so everything that we've known from last class till now, what should we do first? Okay, anybody? Right, the sine function? Sure. So why don't we do this? Why don't we do y of t? We know, so we know a couple things, right? This is part of the section where it's just free and undamped. One spring, one mass. Guaranteed that the, in fact, I'll start here. Let me start here. The fact that my double dot plus ky is equal to 0, this is, this applies, right? Okay, so this is obvious, but we're going to start there. 
you do your force balance, this has to apply. This then implies that our solution is what I wrote for x of t last class. It's one of these, you know, a sine omega nt's plus b cos omega nt's. Okay. So now we just got to fill in the little missing bits, the a's, the b's, and the omega n's. What's omega n? Square root of k over m. And what, is it, what does it mean? It's the natural frequency of the system. Our k is 80, and our mass is 8. So square root of 10, basically. Right? OK, so we got our omega n figured out. Oop. A and b. How do we do A and B? Use our initial conditions, right? So our initial conditions are like the following. Y of 0 is my displacement. And it must be A times sine of 0 plus B cosine of 0. Sine of 0 is just 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. And so this must be equal to my negative 90. Let's do, let's do it in meters, right? Negative 90 millimeters is 0.09 meters. So my B is negative 0 0.09 meters. OK? And then. Initial condition for velocity. Take the derivative, chain rules, apply omega n a cosine 0 right. minus omega n b sine 0. Gone. And this is equal to negative 0.4. So A is negative 0.4 divided by my 3.16. And so now A is 0.127 units of meters. OK, all good? All right, and just, just so you're aware, this was, a, uh, this was a meter per second, right? This was a velocity. And then this was a radian per second. That's my frequency. So that's why dividing those two gives me units of meters. And everything checks out. So our final solution is going to be the following. Therefore, y of t is all of these things put together. So 0.127 sine 3.16t plus b, oops, minus 0 0.09 cosine 3.16t. Pretty easy. All right, so just like we did last class, how do we graph this? Here's my y of t. Here's my time axis. How do you graph something where there's a combination of a sine and a cosine? What's the amplitude of this sinusoid? Is it the 0.127 or the 0.09? Or how do, we, how do we graph this thing properly here? OK, not, not immediately, uh, not immediate, uh, immediately um, detectable, right? It's not easy to see from this how to graph this. 
very different than just the cosine function that I graphed last class. So there's a trick. And the trick is we can actually convert this form to something that is more easily recognizable and graphable. Okay? So here's, here's the deal. Can I remind you guys of a trig identity? So I'm going to remind, reminder, here's a trig identity for you. If I do a sine of two angles added together, a theta and a phi, you might recall this as being sine theta cos phi plus sine phi cos theta. Okay? So that's your good old, good old trig identity. I'm going to replace my theta now. Let me just replace my theta with an omega tn for a second. And so you can, you can see now that I can actually write this as cosine phi sine omega nt plus sine phi cos omega nt. I don't have a phi. I'm just telling you right now that this is just a trig identity. Okay? So is everyone okay with at least the trig identity? Let me introduce something else for you. If I multiply this by an amplitude, let me say a capital C, right? Then that would be the same as if I put a, a capital C here and a capital C here. Right? Okay? So what's interesting about this is that this phi is actually a constant angle in this particular case, the way that I've written it. It's meant to represent something. This really is in the form of our typical solution, the A that I was looking for. So this is kind of like an A. This is kind of like a B. They are the same constants that we were solving with our initial conditions, the displacement and the velocity. All I'm really saying is that you can write a combination of a sine and a cosine with a and b as the constants, as the amplitudes of the individual sinusoids. You can actually combine that using a trig identity and rewrite it in this form. Now this form is much more easily graphable, and I'll show you why in a second. It's because this c is literally the amplitude of this one sinusoid, and this phi represents a phase shift. Okay, so the curve shifts to the left or to the right. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at the math behind this, and I'm going to use this as my example, the one that I just solved. And let's plug in some numbers and see if we can actually graph it from here. All right, so I'm going to just summarize here. Therefore, expect to do this a lot. Expect to say y of t is equal to a c sine omega nt plus phi. And we call this like an alternative form. Of the solution. To y of t. Okay. And, and just from the way that I've I've connected these two things, it should be pretty obvious that what we want is to do the following. We want to say that a of cosine phi, oops, sorry, c of cosine phi, right? c of cosine phi is equal to a, and I want to see that c of sine phi is equal to b. Okay. So the cool thing about this, it means that if I have my a's and b's already, I can actually solve for phi. Here's what I can do. I can take b divided by a, this divided by this, and it is literally c sine phi, c cos phi. The c's cancel, leaving me tan phi. So my phi, my phase shift, is literally the inverse tan of b over a. Okay, so that's pretty cool. It means I can do the following. Inverse tan of b over a 
in my particular case, B is negative 0.09, A is negative 0 0.127. Looks to me like phi is 0 0.616 radians. OK? So I can get phi, and then I can get c as well. Here's how you do c. Notice another really nice uh, trig identity, right? If I do the following, c squared sine squared phi plus c squared cos squared phi. What's sine squared plus cos squared? 1. Right? So this is literally c squared. Right? But this, the way that I've squared a c sine and a c cos, those were just a's and b's. So c squared is just a squared plus b squared. OK? Kind of cool. What this means is the following. These were each individually amplitudes of their own separate sine and cosine. But they're kind of like legs of a triangle, and you're looking for the hypotenuse, essentially. And so that's what you get. You can calculate a C as if it was Pythagorean theorem. So all I, can, all I need to do now is C is A squared plus B squared. And this becomes. Negative 0. Point, well, it'll be positive 0.156 meters. OK? In fact, it'll be plus or minus, and you've got to pick, right? OK, so with the square root one, you can, you can get two solutions. You've got the magnitude that gives you the amplitude. The key is, how do we actually decide if it's plus or minus? There's a, there's a quick and easy way to do it. Just make sure that when you plug in your phi, it agrees with your initial a. Right? So you could have easily gotten c as well, just from any one of these. And I can prove to you that it has to be the negative. So let me erase this equation now. And let me do the following. Let me say that. Uh, C is equal to A cos phi, therefore is negative 0 0.156 meters. So it's the negative. And my alternative solution is now Y of T is equal to negative 0 0.156 sine of omega n plus my phi, 0 0.616, okay? A new form of the exact same solution. Okay? So this one is in units of rads, radians. This is in units of radians. Okay, any questions? I'll take a quick pause right there. Anything that is, that is concerning right now to anybody? Yeah? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I was just trying to make an argument that it is kind of like a Pythagorean theorem if you wanted to understand it. But I, I absolutely agree. I actually like, I like doing this better to get to C. Basically, do C is either A over cos phi or B over sine phi. Okay? So do that. Because it guarantees that you'll get the right sign as well. Okay? Okay, one more thing before I do this graph. <clears throat> and it's 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 related to the fact that I still don't know 0.616, how to properly shift my graph in an axis of time. It's related to time. Okay? So what do, you, what do you think I should do? The best thing I can do is I can actually take this linear function. It's like a 3.16t plus a constant. I can actually factor out the 3.16, the omega n. So imagine me doing this. 
y of t negative 0 0.156 sine, open parenthesis. And now I'm going to stick my omega n, my 3.16. I'm going to put that outside and do a t plus 0 0.616 divide by 3.16. OK? So, so this is this 0 0.616, I want to be absolutely clear, this is now a phi divided by omega n. OK? Why did I do that? Because if you look at the units, a phi, an angle in radians divided by a frequency, is basically in the unit of seconds now. Oops. So this is the actual shift in time on this time axis that I want to draw. OK? So this becomes y of t is equal to negative 0 0.156 sine 3.16t plus 0 0.195 like that, OK? And now I'm ready to graph this. So the graph is as follows. Normally, we would have a sine curve. My sine curve would look like that after one cycle, OK? One cycle, how, how long of a time is one cycle in our case? Use the equation that I came up with last class. It's for a period. A period is 2 pi radians over omega n. So 2 pi divided by 3.16. It's about 1.99 seconds. Okay. So right here, this is a t is equal to 1.99 seconds, one cycle of my sine. I'm now going to flip it because it's a minus. So I'm going to now do, that's my flip. This is clearly my amplitude here. So this is a negative 0 0.156. Okay. And now I'll show you the shift. The shift is such that I want to move it by 0.195 seconds, and I want to move it in such a way where it's the negative 0.195 seconds. Add it to this gives me 0. So if I wanted to move this point here, I'm moving it to the left. OK, does that make sense? OK, I'm basically shifting it left because that would give me my new 0. And my new 0 is only when this is shifted right over here, negative 0 0.195. That is my, that is my shift. And so my, my final curve looks like the following. It's the solid line in all of that. And, and the time now is going to be this minus that, 1.795 seconds is that new point. And question? What do we do with it? We, we've taken it into account by figuring out exactly how long it took for one cycle, the 1.99. It was determined by this 3.16. OK? It's actually a, it's actually a really good question, right? So, so let, me, let me bring it to you another way. So this frequency business, right? I want you to think back to the first time you learned sines and cosines and when we talked about frequency. So, so now let me double the frequency. If I doubled the frequency and it was not 3.16 but 6.32, right? just double it, what does the curve look like if I double the frequency? Right? So it should, it should be like this now. It should be like in one cycle, I would be able to fit two cycles. That's the definition of doubling the frequency. So in fact, a doubled frequency would look like this. Right? That's a doubled frequency, right? Two of the same curves in the same amount of time. 
So that, that 6.13 becomes a 6.32. But what would happen to all of these points here? Well, this point right here, where I did just one cycle of it, right? It's no longer at 1.99. It's now half the time. Right? In half the time, we did one cycle. And that's exactly, it's borne out in the fact that the frequency is moved out of here. OK? More practice, more examples, and you'll get the hang of it. OK, anything, anything else related to this problem? So recap so far through half the lecture, right? I recap, I, re, I revisited the horizontal case of undamped free vibrations, but I made it vertical. Nothing changed in the ordinary differential equation. We solved everything the same way. OK? I solved the problem the same way, and I gave you an alternate solution that gives you an amplitude and a phase shift. OK? So you're frequently going to be asked now to write your solution maybe in the form of a C sine omega nt plus phi. OK? And so the next thing that I want to do is now I want to extend these problems to not just one mass and one spring. OK? So what if I had something like this? OK? So here's my mass. Got a K1, a K2. K3 and a K4, right? OK, so we're, we're quickly moving to these other cases now. Just springs and masses, but I'm multiplying my springs very quickly. What do we do in this particular case? Everything conceptually stays the same. What I'm going to do is I'm going to suggest that at equilibrium, the mass is sitting at x is equal to 0. You're going to move the mass in the positive direction. So perhaps to the right is my positive direction. And you're going to start writing your equations and your force balances like this, right? Mx, max is equal to mx double dot. <coughs> OK? And then we're going to look at which direction the forces are on the spring, on the, on the mass. So what happens if the masses move to the right? Two springs on the left, what happens? They get stretched. So when they get stretched, there's going to be a force that pulls them back. And it'll be k1x, k2x, right? How about the two springs on the right, though? They're being compressed in this case, right? So when they're compressed, they want to go back to their original shape, and they'll push back. So it's k3x, k4x. OK, so, so it's actually interesting. Even though the springs are on the two sides of the mass, because two of them are stretched, two of them are compressed, all four of them will want to return it back to the equilibrium position. So all four of those forces are acting in, to the left. So that means I could write this as follows, minus k1x minus k2x minus k3x minus k4x, which, which then means that I can group all the k's together. And so I can actually write this as mx double dot plus k1 plus k2 plus k3 plus k4 is equal to 0. OK, so very handy. It's also very handy to sort of just sum all of the springs together. We can call that an equivalent spring constant. So perhaps I can write this as a mx double dot k equivalent. Like that, right?
OK, so I'm going to now, these are, these are what I call springs that are in parallel. OK, so they're all, they're all in parallel because they all act independent from one another. They're attached to the mass at different locations. Uh, as you can imagine, I might be able to do something like springs in series. So what happens if I do springs in series? It's kind of like if I did this. Okay, so I put the two springs in series, and then I have a K1, and I have a K2. Okay, and the same thing, you've got a mass, you move it in the x direction. Okay, so how do, how do we deal with springs in series? Well, the important, the important thing is to note that when this mass moves by x units of distance, the x units of distance is actually partly from spring one and partly from spring two. Right? So you, you don't really quite know how much each spring is going to take up in terms of displacement. right? But here's what we do know. If they're connected in series, then the force transmits through the spring. right? So, so basically, if I cut the springs in half here, the, 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 the place where the two springs are connected to each other, there are equal and in, in opposite internal forces, clearly. right? So I can, I can write. Uh, I can write this as follows. Okay, so I can take a look at the free body diagram of each spring. And so imagine that this, this spring is basically pushing on the wall with the force F, but there's a, a force F here, a force F here. Those are internal forces that cancel. And there's a force here that's being applied by the mass on the end of the spring. Okay, And then I want to make sure that the displacement from spring 1 here, this is a K1, that it displaces by x1. This is K2, and it displaces by x2. right? Okay, So the way that I would set up these equations is going to be like this. It would be sum of forces in the x is my mx double dot. Okay. And it's effectively equal to both like a force that is equal to k1 over x1 or a k2 over x2, right? So here's my here's my force. The force is k1 x1. Force is also k2 x2, right? OK, so I only know the forces that are happening in both of the springs. I know that it's k1x1, k2x2. I don't really know a whole lot else. But I, what if I tried to find, again, like a, an equivalent spring constant? How would, that, how would that look? Essentially, what I'm saying is, let's try to take these two. And if I wanted to see how far the mass was pulling both of those springs, it would be the equivalent of me saying, there has to be like a keq with a total x, where this x is equal to my x1 times x2, like a x1, x1 plus x2. Okay? It's like, an equip, like a, one spring that replaces both of the springs. It displaces by a total amount x. And that total amount is equal to an x1 plus an x2. So how do I rearrange this? This x1 is literally going to be the same force k and a k1. So I'm going to do the following, keq x is equal to keq, oops, sorry, second here. x is equal to x1 plus x2. Okay. 
So it's literally like that, where the force transmitted across both of the springs divided by this equivalent spring constant that I'm looking for would be equal to the same force over one spring, the same force over the other spring added together. I can actually eliminate the Fs. And I can get 1 over KEQ is equal to 1 over K1 plus 1 over K2. So by now, you're, you're probably seeing this uh, analogy with electric circuits, parallels in series, and everything else, right? And so the way that you view it is um, these springs, they're, they're really just like capacitors, right? Capacitors are meant to store energy, store electrical energy, and springs store energy, right? They store elastic energy. And so when you look at it, when two, when two capacitors are in series effectively, you have the same equations, right? OK, so let's do one more example. We're going to do one of these, right? So three springs all Okay, so, so I've got some information for you, the mass, the three spring constants. Now, when you, see, when you see a situation like this, the first thought is because there's two connections to this mass, this mass actually has a chance to rotate, right? It could be a rigid body. It may rotate. But for the purposes of this particular chapter for this course in vibrations when we're doing this, we always assume that this is just 1D motion, right? So no rotation of the mass. And you've been asked to do the following. Find OK? So you're just basically asked to find some properties of the behavior of the system, the frequency, the natural frequency, the period. You're, you're, you're being told an amplitude, and we're asked, what is the maximum velocity and acceleration now of the mass? At what point do they reach a peak in its acceleration and velocity? So now we're being asked to find things like maximums and minimums in the problem. Okay, so here's our, here's, our, here's our solution. Omega n is clearly going to be a KEQ over mass, so equivalent spring constant, right? In other words, we still want it to be, we still want it to be in this particular form. We want it to be an nmax double dot. The whole point is you want to solve a ordinary differential equation like this that gives you meaning to omega n. And so we need to lump all the, KEQ, all the k's together to make ourselves a k e q. 
Okay? So how do we do that? The first thing you do is you make sure that you combine K1 and K2. So the first KEQ is you know, like a KEQ on the left is literally a 1 over K1 plus 1 over K2. Right? So this is like a 1 KEQ left. This is a 1 over 60 plus a 1 over 240. And so this will give you 48. And then finally, the total KEQ would then be, it would be like you took those two springs on the left, you replaced it with a 48, and then you added the 48 to the 30. So it would be 78 Newton meters. And so omega n would be 78 over 25 square root, 1.76 radians per second. So period is just that, 2 pi over omega n. OK. And then for your solution then, I'm going to start piecing all this stuff together. Here's what we're going to do. Remember I did the, the alternate solution and I had an amplitude? I just gave you the amplitude from part B as 3 centimeters. So I can literally write this as 0.03 meters times the sine of omega nt, right? Omega n, I've already got the answer, 1.76t plus phi, right? I don't really know phi yet, so we can find phi. But, but I don't even need phi to answer this question. This question is asking me to find max velocity, max acceleration, right? So what does that entail? That basically says the following. Max velocity is when if I took my solution and I, uh, and I looked for the, the derivatives of this thing, right? The derivatives of them are going to be equally the same type of form in sinusoids and, and uh, sines or cosines, right? So I'm going to take the derivative. And so what you're going to get is for velocity, velocity would be y dot t, the derivative of my displacement equation. And all that ends up becoming is take the omega n as the chain rule, it comes out. So it's literally 0.03 times omega n times the cosine of this, right? And if I take another derivative, then that gives me the solution to acceleration. This is y double dot t. And this becomes 0.03 omega n squared, because it's another chain rule, another omega n pops out the cosine becomes a negative sine. So I'll put a minus sign in front. So we can do the following. But what, what exactly is the maximum velocity or maximum acceleration? It is the amplitude of each of these. right? It's as if, because cosine is, is between plus and minus 1. So the amplitude gives you max velocity after one derivative. And the amplitude down here, this 0.003 omega n squared, this is the one that gives you your max acceleration. OK? So that's typically the types of things that we're going to be asking for. We want you to find this solution, and then we're going to ask you to look for things associated with the sine curve. It gives you information about the motion of the mass. Okay? 
Any questions? All right, otherwise, have a great weekend. I'll see you guys on Monday.